Welcome to Navigating the Next Future, adding foresight to financial insight. Often, I think, we think about the top issues facing the accounting industry in 2022, let's say. But shouldn't the starting point be the top issues facing accounting industry clients so that we can better understand their challenges and help to deliver better solutions? So let's start by looking at the wider world, the world we all operate in, because we know that it's increasingly subject to significant change, don't we? Our focus is very often on the potential implications of new emerging technology, exponential technology developments, things like artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, augmented and virtual reality. But it's important to remember that political, economic and social changes are also happening at breakneck speed. And when you add that with the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, all these things act together on life, society and business and add to a, both our personal and organisational sense of uncertainty. The challenge is to navigate the next future and to make sense of an increasingly uncertain future so we can help our clients and ourselves better. So what I want to do during the next 30 minutes or so is first of all underline what I see as part of the leadership challenge. Secondly, I want to think about some future change contexts and future change drivers, and I'll use a steep framework for that. Um, thirdly, I want to look at just at some of the learnings that we can take from the pandemic, learnings that resonate strongly with me. Um, and uh, fourthly, I want to explore what foresight can tell us and how about the future. And then we'll conclude with five ways we can navigate the next future. So do have in mind as we go through this, how you might support your clients given the backdrop I'm going to describe. But let's start with what it means for us to face such uncertainty and such complexity, because I think what it does, it creates time for extraordinary financial leadership. And what I mean by that is that in the past, we've really been able to have a fair degree of certainty about how the future is going to play out. And that's allowed us to reach consensus, to come to agreement quite easily about what we think we're going to need to do. That's the realm of ordinary leadership, of, of tame problems, if you like. But increasingly, we're far from certain about the future. And what that does, it makes it much harder to reach consensus, to come to agreement about the way ahead. This is what I mean for about extraordinary leadership, about this being a time for extraordinary financial leadership. But you know, there is something that I think organizations can do about it. And, and this is working on three time horizons in parallel. The first is about operational excellence. So focusing on the current year, making sure we win the race for the current year so that we're here for next year and the year after, critically important, of course. Secondly, is to think about searching for growth, looking forward two to five years, say, typically through our strategic planning processes and looking to perhaps extrapolate trends from the past. Now, there's a bit of a danger here in that if we're not careful, we can reinforce our past biases through extrapolating those trends. So it creates a full sense of security as we conduct that strategic planning. But really successful organizations also operate on this third time horizon. And this one, I think the three time horizons in parallel is critical. And this is where we look longer term. We get ourselves way above the horizon so we can understand future drivers, look at the things that might be emerging across the horizon, new technology, new ways of doing business, new political paradigms, that kind of thing. This isn't about creating a particular prediction, it's about exploring the nature of future uncertainty and gaining the insight, the foresight that we can from that work. But you know, that actually sets up a big mindset challenge. And I think the more established and the bigger our organizations are, the bigger that challenge is to change the underlying organizational DNA. 
At its simplest level, it's actually a binary choice. We can play by the rules of the game or we can create a new game. But doing what we've always done isn't necessarily going to always give us what we've always got. That kind of idea that we might be a bit defensive and stand still, I think is fatally flawed. Because if we stand still, the rest of the world moves forward. It overtakes us. So I think that creating a new game is absolutely critical. What do I mean by that? I mean about exploring alternatives, exploring new ideas, new developments, trying different things, experimenting and learning as we go. Because the future is going to be different. So how is always doing the same thing ever going to work? And there's some interesting evidence to suggest that it doesn't work, actually. McKinsey looked at Standard & Poor's 500 index, and they found that in 1958, the average age of a corporation was 60 years. Today, it's 18. There's an interesting question as to why so many corporations have fallen by the wayside. More than that, they estimate, they predict that by 2027, 75% of the current corporations listed in the S&P 500 will have disappeared. I think this goes back to change and a, and a very human perspective on change. And there are two things I'd like to say about this. First of all, I don't think people resist change. They resist being changed. And that's because, in my opinion, there are some kind of built in hardwired biology that's kind of part of our humanity. And it's our limbic systems and our limbic systems are designed to make us prefer familiarity, to make us prefer consistency, where the safety. And it takes us away from the uncertainty that creates more complexity. It creates a fear. So our limbic systems is part of our basic bio biology that takes us away from change. So what I've done there is looked at just a snapshot, a couple of the important, what I think are the important leadership challenges to help us to navigate to the next future. Let's now look at some macro future drivers using the steep framework. And the first characteristic or the first category I want to get to is social and societal shifts. So what am I thinking about here? Well, I'm thinking about things like social developments, including demographics, um, declining values, the changing nature of religion and how religion plays a part um, in our lives or not. Lifestyle shifts, the way our perspectives on values change, what we mean by family, migration patterns, even consumer behavior. And the kind of the overarching um, element here, I think, of urbanization. And what that does, that sets up a challenge for societal system redesign, things like healthcare, education, the opportunities for universal basic income and services. Let's now think about the T of STEEP, technology, and particularly the exponential development of technology. Now, here, as well as the individual technologies, I'm thinking about factors like innovation, about communication, energy, transport, research and development, and how these ideas are impacted by patent regulations and the life cycle of products. But our emerging technology landscape really is quite extraordinary. And it's a very different technology landscape than we've ever seen before in human history. Just think about it. 3D printing and 4D printing, atomically precise manufacturing, nanotechnology, quantum computing, extended reality technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, haptics, the metaverse. Think about blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Think about synthetic biology, human enhancement, robotics and drones, and the group of technologies that I think tie many of those together, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this is what makes what's going to happen in our next future very different, such a radical change than we've ever seen before. The first D is about environmental imperatives. So the environment, climate change, biodiversity. So if we think about climate change and the causes of climate change, we're obviously talking about um, reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, thinking about how we create energy, how we generate it, how we use it, how we get around the world, uh, mitigation technologies to help us protect our world 
from the ravages of increasing natural disasters. Things like biodiversity protection, and the example here I'd use is pollinators, the critical importance of pollinators, pollinating insects to agriculture. Thinking about the natural ecosystem and how we protect it, the quality and availability of water, the quality of soil to grow plants for food, and how we stop pollution. And finally, human encroachment into natural habitats, this kind of increasing overlap we have between the human and the natural world, and the potential risks there are around things like a disease crossing from animals to humans. Now, second E is economy and economic development. And I think the big thing on most people's, at the front of most people's minds is the post COVID economic recovery, both globally and locally, and how those two overlap. And part of that is about the re emerging nature of international trade and possible protectionism, particularly between trading blocks, the growth of Asia, the growth of Africa, supply chain resilience, something I'm going to come back to in a little while, the evolution of the digital economy and the use of cryptocurrencies, taxation both at the national and at the global level, and finally the evolution of the circular economy and how we might in the future see the ability to recycle products and materials actually built into their underlying design. And finally the P for political. We have to acknowledge initially the B word. Brexit's not completely done and dusted yet. There are other global, regional and national political shifts and tensions and conflict, tensions that we've got used to thinking about in the context of non-state actors, but as we see playing out in East, Eastern Europe, state actors as well. Political developments are critically important here and critically important that we understand the potential implication on life, society and business. They can highly influence individuals and organizations. And it's critically important, I think, to stay abreast of those political developments because they can affect many aspects of our operating environment. Political stability, the regulation of monopolies, tax policy, and so on, the way that different incentives are put into the system to help enterprise, all these things are the result of political developments. So we've looked first of all, or we looked first of all at a couple of issues relating to leadership, and we've just then looked at the change context, the future change drivers that we're starting to see. Now what I want to do is just explore some of the things I think we can learn from the pandemic. And I've already mentioned resilience once, but responding with resilience is, I think, crucially important. And we've seen it across the private, public, and the third sectors. And the the benefits of building resilience are obvious. When we think about manufacturing and supply chain flexibility, a lack of flexibility that we saw early on in the, in the pandemic. But what we have noticed is that actually there are, there's a need to focus on critical products, critical equipment, critical materials to make sure we can continue to move the economy along and move life along with whatever disruption is thrown at us. That does represent, I think, a challenge to the notion that we've become used to of just-in-time inventory management. And the question is, are we willing to pay for resilience? Because there is a cost to pay. Furlough, I thought, was an interesting idea that also kind of builds into this resilience because it allowed enterprise and employers generally to make sure that while they didn't have business, they could retain employees ready for when things turned around. But the critical thing I think about responding with resilience and being able to work around these ideas is to use foresight to help us address some critical uncertainties so that we can build resilience into our organizations, our processes and systems. We can identify potentially wildcards and that allows us to build contingency, not just financial contingency, but capability contingency as well. One of the things I think that COVID has shown us is the need to develop and build organizational agility. Thinking about our business model, delivering value to customers and clients. And I think there's kind of a matrix we can form here. If we have existing customers, for example, on the y-axis and new customers um, and needs on the um, x-axis, 
we can look at the combination of existing customers, existing needs, existing customers, new needs, new customers with existing needs and new customers with new needs. And we can help and we can use that to help us understand where we need to invest our time, what we need to do with our products and services and how and who we need to communicate around our business model. We can also think about agility as being something that helps us operate effectively and efficiency. And part of that agility was switching between office and home working and remote working. There are some challenges around here though, because that means we need to invest in tech. So all these things need to come together in order for us to build organizational agility. There's also some interesting trends around urbanization and, and a question as to whether in some respects, the urbanization trend we've been seeing is being reversed. So typically um, uh, futurists and, and forecasters have made the assumption that something like three quarters of the global population could be urbanized by 2050. Has the pandemic changed that? There's certainly some evidence to suggest that things like fear of viral infection and remote working is actually driving this possible reversal. We're starting to see it emerge potentially in house price increases, hour, two hour away, two hours away from urban centers. But the second and third order effects here are potentially very important because they change, first of all, how we view our homes and what our homes provides. Safety for our families, but also a safe place to work. The idea that reversal of urbanization um, could be something that um, hits us in the near and midterm also affects our ability to impact and recruit talent effectively. Then there's also the issue of how remote working changes the relationship between employer and employee. It brings up issues of trust, of supervision, of management, of focusing on outputs rather than presenteeism. And finally, if we wrap all these things together, poses a question, do we want to restore the old order or do we want to go for a total system reboot? So is there an opportunity here for us to look at some of the accelerated changes we've seen through the pandemic, reflect on them, think about the lessons learned and use that insight to consider our options going forward. Never waste a good crisis, as the saying has it. So we've now explored some of the things we can learn from the pandemic. Before that, we looked at some of the future change drivers. And right at the top, we started with some of the leadership challenges. So what I want to do now is just think about what can foresight tell us about the future and how? Let's start by thinking about what foresight is. And foresight is a range of tools and techniques to help us explore the future. It's a structured process that involves critical thinking and very often is applicable across a wide range of factors, which is why using something like PEST or STEEP or STEEPL, one of those frameworks is really important when we start to think about foresight. Let's just have a quick look at some of the tools and when and where we would use them. This isn't an exhaustive list, and I'd really encourage you to look at the range of different foresight tools and make sure that you pick the right one. So the obvious one and the first one that most people go to is trend analysis, looking at trend, trends, which is particularly useful when we're looking into the near term because we see visible evidence of the trends direction of travel. Something might be growing, it might be becoming more frequent, it might be in decline, but there's clear evidence of the trends trajectory. And we can use that evidence to extrapolate that trend into the future. But just be cautious about extrapolating trends because they use the past history to determine the future outcome. And what we don't know is whether there are other trends or other things that we might not have seen that will affect the performance of that trend. That's where horizon scanning comes in. Horizon scanning is particularly useful for the mid to long term. And here we look for developments, scenarios, weak signals, wildcards, where there's indication of something different happening in the future, but limited evidence. We think it might be highly impactful, but it's also uncertain but it must be plausible as well. 
The third tool I wanted to talk about, and we'll drill down into this in a little bit more detail, is scenario planning, scenario development. And here what we're doing, we're looking mid to long term to create a view of the future, to create plausible storylines about how the future might play out. We combine future factors, things like driving forces, trends, horizon scanning insights to get a sense of the longer term future. Scenarios are not about creating a prediction or a multiple predictions. They're about creating plausible storylines. So plausible and plural storylines. And this range of storylines help us think about uncertainty in the future and what we might do in any of those different storylines. So what I'm going to do now is just to briefly explore four scenarios that I was involved with putting together for a book we published in 2020. So these particular storylines, these four scenarios, were created by the looking at the intersection between two driving forces. The post-pandemic economic recovery, would we see a deep and prolonged downturn, or would we see a, ro um, a robust economic rebound? And containment and management of the COVID-19 pandemic, would we see a poorly contained pandemic, or would we see eradication of the pandemic? And we created four future worlds. The first was called the VIP economy. And the VIP economy saw a poorly contained pandemic and a vibrant economic rebound. In this future, we see the exacerbation of the already existing divides and inequalities. There's a bleak global picture. The wealthier nations continue to ensure their populations have access to the appropriate testing, treatment, and vaccinations with limited availability for the rest of the world. Social distancing measures put in place in many countries to protect the middle class and wealthy from those in poorer areas leave more densely populated areas with higher infection rates, particularly for the new variants of COVID. Governments in developed economies do emphasize the need to reboot economies and enterprises at the heart of that economic recovery. But travel bans continue to be imposed on those countries who continue to struggle to contain COVID. Our second scenario might be considered to be the utopian future of the four. Here we have inclusive abundance. We see eradication of the pandemic and a vibrant economic rebound. Those in power accept that the COVID pandemic is an opportunity to innovate and transform in response to the pandemic. Alongside testing, treatment and vaccination, a globally inclusive regeneration around the UN Sustainable Development Goals becomes the chosen way forward and it finds its way into national government policies around the world. Science and technology are seen as central to a new agenda of helping us protect society against future pandemics. Mechanisms such as universal basic income and services are used much more readily than they ever thought possible in the past as a temporary measure to support those in need across society. Our third scenario is safe but hungry. And here we see eradication of the pandemic and a deep and prolonged downturn. In response to multiple infection waves from new COVID variants, public pressure built and the need to prioritize health over the economy was actually taken up by politicians across most major countries. As a result, government resources have been and continue to be directed at ongoing treatment and vaccinations. Restrictions imposed to help manage new waves of infections are lifted very cautiously across many countries. Social distancing controls and protective measures are uh, that were, have been imposed on businesses and public transport are the last to go. The economic recovery is much slower to materialize. However, ultimately it feels more sustainable and inclusive because of the increased confidence that the virus is under greater control. And finally, the long goodbye. And the long goodbye might be considered to be the dystopian view of the future. And here we have a poorly contained pandemic and a deep and prolonged economic downturn. This is the beginning of a slow 
and painful end to the systems, the structures and the hierarchies that are no longer fit for purpose. Many countries yo-yo in and out of lockdown as the new COVID-19 variants come and go. Major economies, including the US, fail to adequately control the situation, leading to a very slow decline in infections punctuated by periodic peaks. Domestic recovery and global trade are hampered, and some nations are fearful of opening their borders to foreign visitors. Reluctance to work to global solution leads to ongoing infection spikes with many countries unable to keep pace with new variants. Now, the critical thing here that I'll, I'll repeat is that these four scenarios are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but they are plausible and they allow us to think, so what might each of these scenarios mean for our organizations in the future? What are the things that we might need to put in place? What are the contingencies that we might need to make? How do we develop agility within the organization to ensure our success across each of these four scenarios? So how do we navigate the next future? Here are five ways we might do that. Firstly, understand the context of future change. Use something like a steep framework and look at those different drivers of change that we're already starting to see that could have a significant impact across life, society and business in the future. It's important to do that to understand the outside world because that's the landscape we'll be operating within. Two, build on that insight and use foresight to think about the implications of future change. Explore the uncertainty because that helps us develop resilience and agility. Three, focus on developing cycles of experimentation and learning because doing what we've always done and getting what we've always got is not sustainable for our long-term future. We have to think differently. We have to try new ideas. We have to put those ideas into practice. We have to come up with a new game to be successful. Four, help clients to evaluate potential risks and opportunities that we see through understanding those change drivers, understanding the potential implications of foresight and looking at the results of our experiments and our learning. And five, challenge our traditional mindsets about what success is, how we get to success, where we should future and how we embrace the opportunities as well as mitigate against the risks that exist within our uncertain future. Thank you for listening. I do hope you enjoyed that. I do hope it was useful. If you want to get in touch with me, then you can find me in all the usual places or you can email me at steve at informingchoices.com. Thank you.